$10,000 trade alert. All right, guys, this is our message to investors that are part of the Portfolio Builder Advisory Service. Whether you're just getting started or you're already invested with our asset allocation strategy, uh, really, I see two outcomes that are on the verge of transpiring right now. Either we're going to see a stock and cryptocurrency melt up if Russia does not invade, which I think there's a high likelihood that things are about to cool down a little bit. We'll talk about the, uh, the headlines pouring through right now. Ukraine just uh, declared a national state of emergency. They're getting hacked. And of course, Russia has now essentially taken half of Ukraine over. Um, meanwhile, NATO and the US are not doing a damn thing about it. Bunch of very light sanctions that are meaningless uh, outside of uh, shutting down a, a gas pipeline, which is why we're long boil. So in general, what I see is energy costs are going to come down if there's a de-escalation. Bond yields fall, inflation falls. You want to be long cryptocurrencies and the NASDAQ. On the other hand, if Russia does invade, then the inflation is going to get worse. We're already seeing U.S. media outlets blame the inflation on the conflict, uh, which is a total joke, because we all know the inflation has been here for well over a year, and this conflict is new, but they're already trying to blame the U.S. inflation on oil and gas costs on a conflict that's barely begun. Um, and so that's a big problem. If Russia does keep pushing uh, and NATO and the U.S. does respond in a meaningful manner, and they may not, the honest truth is they may not do anything uh, because they are in a pickle. They cannot afford an energy crisis, inflation crisis right now because it would potentially melt down the bond market. Um, so if they see this push through and NATO does decide to really fight back, we're likely going to see Russia cut off energy to Europe, which would be a travesty. Uh, we're going to see energy costs go skyrocketing. And we're probably going to see the stock market crash. So let's look at our current trade allocation strategy for the high risk program. And so step one is to buy that stock crash insurance UVXY. This is far different than buying an inverse ETF. It does not make money if stocks slightly go down or slowly go down. It only makes money if you get a black swan event there's a massive panic and you start getting limit down days. And that's what's gonna happen if Russia does go into Kyiv and the US and NATO uh, get some balls and actually sanction Russia in a meaningful way. It's not clear that they will. Uh, and it's not clear that Putin's going to go any further than he has currently. So I still think this is an unlikely outcome, but we are hedged to the brim. We have absolute, no problem if World War III breaks out and we go into a hot war that could even potentially have nuclear weapons firing off. So UVXY is your insurance policy. Think of it as life insurance. You don't want to use it, uh, but if you have to, it's going to really save your butt. And we have a massive position with a $10,000 trade alert. You'd be picking up 86 shares of UVXY. And what's important is it can go up faster than stocks go down. So it allows us to remain long because we know the most likely outcome is we're not about to blow up the planet and that most likely we're on the verge of stocks going back up. That's really my base case right now. So we're hedged and I do think we're about to see a de-escalation and that we're gonna wanna cut our hedge probably in half or a third, depending on how much higher it goes up. And just don't forget, you had 10% long UVXY in February of 2020 before the global economy went to a shutdown and oil went negative and markets crashed and there was lots and lots of pain in the markets, limit down days. A 10% position went up 1,100%. So you actually, uh, if you didn't even touch your portfolio, you just had that insurance, let it go up and back down, you ended up having relatively low drawdown, especially compared to the rest of the world. Now, I do want to point out most of the gains in UVXY happened in that fourth week, where it went from a 500% gain to an 1100% gain 
in about seven trading days. So uh, this thing can just go exponentially to the upside if things really go bad. Um, but you don't wanna just bet on downside. We've had one of the most vicious NASDAQ sell-offs in decades and all data points to a slowing economy. That's the second this uh, conflict de-escalates, energy costs are gonna come down. We're already seeing falling prices on used cars, houses, real estate, interest rates are rising. Uh, very clear signs that the bond market meltdown is over and that we're gonna see again, a absolute melt up in tech, which would be for us the triple Q. Uh, we have some good Asian exposures in our safe growth strategy with EDC, but our by far our favorite pick for the best gain is to go long ETHE. And that puppy is trading at a 20% plus discount. So we're gonna actually outperform Ethereum to the upside when this does rebound, okay? so. At the end of the day, uh, that's where we wanna make the big money over the next several years and decades is betting on the growth of technology. And for our high risk strategy, we see no better bet over this coming decade than Ethereum. So sure, is there some downside risk ahead? Yes, uh, but the upside is absolutely massive. And when you understand what Ethereum is doing to revolutionize financial markets, it is truly breathtaking. It's in its infancy. And we highly recommend you go long ETHE, the Grayscale Trust, with 217 shares of ETHE. Here's a look at that chart. We do need to update it. It's come down a bit, uh, but today it's trading uh, at a little bit of a discount from yesterday. So it's at 2056. And I don't think it'll be long before this breaks into new highs. Now, the next position uh, actually would typically do really well in the environment we're heading into without the Russia-Ukraine conflict. In fact, if we look at the last two tightening cycles where the Federal Reserve tried to hike interest rates and eventually reduce its balance sheet, while China was simultaneously increasing credit to bump up the GDP of their economy, primarily through uh, lots of real estate development, which is their plans right now. Natural gas was the single best performing asset during the last two cycles this occurred. So we're actually really bullish on boil uh, generally, as well as oil. Uh, but this conflict is the main ace up the sleeve for Putin. If they try to get tough with him, he's gonna cut off gas and it's gonna make the prices uh, in America skyrocket. It's gonna make global prices skyrocket. And so boil is a play on that. Platinum's another one where we could potentially look at, uh, but in general, this is the main threat. We're gonna have the lowest storage typically at the end of February. So uh, if Putin's gonna make some moves, it's most likely going to occur in the next two to four weeks when he has all the advantages in the world. So we've got 97 shares of Boyle. It's gone up a little bit, but nowhere where it can go if things escalate. And again, this would be if the US actually did meaningful sanctions that would actually hurt Russia's economy. Uh, but again, the problem is it would cripple Europe. And so uh, this is now trading a bit higher than the picture, uh, but this is at $38, the high we saw just last September, again, without a war about to break out, uh, was up in the 90s. So this could more than double from here easily, if not triple or quadruple with a real war breaking out. So we just patiently sit back and watch this play out. Let's take a look at the asset allocation here. So right now, if we look at the trade alert screenshot, which you'll have in your email, uh, whether you're a paid member, we break it down into one unit. Uh, and if you're on a free trial, we break it into a, a $10,000 starting position. So right now we have a 14.8% crash insurance hedge. Okay, so most likely we'd have to have meaningful 
sanctions by NATO on Russia for that really to, to fly. And probably the market would front run it if Putin decides to invade uh, the capital of Ukraine in the coming days. Uh, so, so far he's marched his army and taken over about half of Ukraine. And now it's a wait and see what happens next. The US response and NATO's response has been absolutely nothing. Um, so, so far the crash insurance is cheap if things continue uh, to escalate. And the big question is Putin gonna blink? Is he gonna be happy with what he's taken? And, uh, and then pause uh, for a while and let things simmer down. Because uh, he would essentially have a win for his country with pretty much no pain whatsoever. Okay, so that's the 14% hedge. It's still cheap again compared to what could be on the brink of occurring. And it's a critical position in our portfolio. The second we see a serious resolution, uh, we do want to reduce that probably back down to the 7 to 8% range. So stay tuned for that trade alert. Now, if things do de-escalate, I'm expecting energy costs to fall, which is really keeping the CPI up and putting pressure on the bond market. If the bond market's happy, growth stocks dominate. And again, our favorite long-term play over the decade ahead is to be long Ethereum, Grayscale Trust, ETHE. We like the NASDAQ, but I do think you're gonna get many multiples of higher returns with Ethereum compared to being long the big giants uh, like Apple and Amazon, because they've already created a monopoly and are many decades into their business development. Ethereum is less than a decade old, and it's quickly, again, replacing the entire U.S. banking, financial insurance, and stock brokerage uh, system completely into a DeFi world. Very exciting. And it, generally, what we want to do is time getting more aggressive on Ethereum at these very, very cheap prices. And I'm ready to pull the trigger the second we see this de-escalation occur. Now, the boil play is huge right now at 38%. This is, again, a good position during a rate hike, rate hike cycle, which is likely going to last for two years, starting in March. Um, but I do think energy costs in general are overstretched and due for a swift pullback, uh, which is where I will give you a new trade alert to go along. Uh, I have two plays in mind. And again, I want to see oil fall back down to 80 on a de-escalation trade. Okay, so we're going to time selling boil and reducing UVXY based on the geopolitical conflicts occurring. And so that's been my exclusive attention uh, over the last few weeks, trying to get a feel for what's going to, uh, to happen here. So that's where we're looking and how we have our assets allocated. Uh, again, you've got growth, which means bond yields are falling or flat with ETHE. You have your inflation hedge with natural gas. If interest rates are rising, that's the greatest threat to Ethereum. And if we get all out panic, uh, that does create systemic selling in cryptocurrencies as well. So we've, we've really got two positions that are guarding your Ethereum. We wanna be long Ethereum for the coming decade. The other two positions are simply there to protect that position, reduce volatility uh, and prepare us to really get aggressive on that position soon as the coast is clear. So how did we perform last year with our hybrid strategy? A 233% return. Uh, there were plenty of down months, but boy, oh boy, these assets can skyrocket under the right conditions. And if you don't have your, your line in the water, you're not going to catch the big fish. If we go back and look at our track record, which we will, we'll see that there's a few months that deliver the bulk of the gains. So if you don't have your money in the market, you're likely going to miss the massive jumps. And I do think we are on the verge of a de-escalation and a melt-up in tech stocks and the NASDAQ. So are you ready to triple your money? If so, start following our trade alerts and join our webinars. Let's talk big picture. The global economy is clearly slowing down. I believe inflation will peak out in March and fall into April. This means the bond market's gonna stop crashing and you wanna be long growth stocks. 
And in fact, I, I think we're really at the edge of the end of this sell-off in bonds. We've had the TLT, JNK, and LQD all sell-off uh, all year, creating pain in equities. Uh, but in general, if Russia tensions ease, energy costs fall, and the inflation cools off rapidly. This means falling bond yields will propel Ethereum to new highs, uh, potentially in 2022. As we uh, uh, head into midterms, there's probably going to be uh, much less friction uh, heading into midterms here. So when we look at our options for investing, right now, cash, uh, long-term is trash. Okay, it was a good play over the last three months, but will it continue to be? Not likely. The U.S. is running massive twin deficits. This means we are importing more goods than we export. And we're running up debt by the trillions. This puts pressure on the dollar to lose purchasing power over time. So it's not a great long-term play. Uh, bonds are still ugly. Okay, this sell-off has been pretty brutal, and it they are approaching a, a buy level. Uh, but at this point, I would much rather be long growth stocks than bonds because the inflation is likely going to be stickier. Uh, than many are estimating, and it could create a, a relatively low return in bonds, even if the crash stops in the short term. So what we really want to see for bonds to become a buy, which makes my job a lot easier to be frank, I love having bonds, uh, but you got to realize we have artificially driven yields low while printing trillions of dollars and injecting it into the economy creating this massive inflationary wave. So we really want to see the CPI falling towards 3% and buy into bonds uh, once we probably see a final leg down in bonds. So I'm actually calling for a short-term relief rally in bonds and then potentially more pain before we get peak yields in the bond market. Um, so that's my expectation and when we would actually go long bonds. So right now, when you look at your options, you really have no other logical uh, location to store wealth. It's likely going to be a melt up in stocks, cryptocurrencies, and commodities until there's an alternative. And the only alternative is, again, uh, a decent yielding bond relative to the inflation in the economy. And right now, there's just such a dramatic mismatch. We've got the 10-year at 2% but yet we're facing 7.5% CPI. We've just got a 25% PPI out of Germany, the producer price index. So uh, Russia has really got the uh, Western alliances stuck. I don't see the US or Europe being able to stand up to Russia at, in a meaningful way without creating significant pain. So my bet is de-escalation is on the verge and that we're gonna see the growth stocks skyrocket up. If I'm wrong, we are heavily hedged against the opposite outcome, which could be very disastrous uh, if, again, we actually try to put pain on Russia in a meaningful way. So it's critical you watch our webinar every Monday, Wednesday, Friday to be ready for sell alerts. Okay, so most likely we're going to be dumping UVXY and boil and going big on Ethereum in the high risk strategy. For the safe growth strategy, I like the NASDAQ and Bitcoin. So GBTC and the triple Q. That's where I see us adding exposure after selling UVXY and boil. Uh, but we got to be patient and see just how crazy this is about to get. Now, if you're on a free trial, you're not going to get the sell alerts. I'm sorry, we're getting you positioned. But if you want to know when to sell, take profits, and reallocate capital, you must call Dean. And his phone number is 505-322-7515. Again, that's 505-322-7515. And if you do want to test drive more than $10,000, call him right now. He can create a customized screenshot for any amount of money you want to test drive during your free trial. Okay, I'm going to take a quick look at the chats and we'll look at uh, the news feed to start out. Okay, so let's see what we've got. Uh, Ed says, is the market doing the work for the Fed, making them less hawkish, less need to raise rates 
and inflation coming down. Nailed it, Ed. You nailed it. Um, absolutely. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this was all theater to, to get inflation down eventually and to blame the current inflation on a scapegoat. Uh, but we'll see. Maybe we're about to break out into World War III and I'm wrong. Okay, uh, Bushin says Pentagon is holding a live briefing right now. Yeah, I have that queued up to watch after. Okay, Gary says, what do you expect from government regulations? Likely forthcoming in the near future. Yeah, so Biden says he's gonna issue an executive order on cryptocurrencies. I think they're going to basically tell uh, companies like Coinbase that they have to have the capacity to block uh, criminal Bitcoin addresses that they identify. And so that's what I'm anticipating. This could lead to a lot of money going off of centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges. Now, the infrastructure bill was potentially a risk to DeFi, but it's unclear how they can regulate a decentralized exchange. It's not owned by uh, typically a single person. Um, so they definitely are potentially going to have some sort of executive order that could create some volatility, but maybe it gives more clarification and helps uh, corporations uh, essentially adopt cryptocurrencies faster. So we've got to wait and see on that. In general, I'm not too worried about it, as I still see big banks, big hedge funds who have insider knowledge uh, buying the dip. Okay, that's what's been happening. The biggest wallets in crypto have been gobbling up this volatility, and the weak hands have been selling. And so uh, I don't see a huge problem on that. Okay, Brianc says, do we sell UVXY on a huge spike? Yeah, if we get a huge spike, then, and then we see a resolution, then we sell it uh, as fast as possible. Victor says, hi, Jason. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here live. So, so yeah, the U.S. administration's been saying that Russia's going to completely invade all of Ukraine and they've been saying this for weeks. So we will see if that really plays out or not. Uh, Jean sa or Jean says, what's the impact of Germany canceling the deal to build a gas pipeline from Russia? Well, that'll make natural gas prices go up. Uh, so we have boil for that. All right, let's take a look at these headlines. Keep those questions coming in. And, uh, and yeah, if we're going to get a conflict, we're hedged. We're going to sell the hedges and we're going to we're going to buy Ethereum. We're going to buy the Nasdaq. And we're going to buy uh, Bitcoin at really cheap prices uh, if this does continue to escalate. And again, the U.S. and NATO could punish Russia, but the problem is it would punish themselves in a really, really bad way. So I'm not so sure they're going to really do much about uh, anything that Russia wants to do, as long as it's only in Ukraine. Okay, so Biden expands the Russia sanctions to Nord Stream 2. U.S. eyes released from oil reserves as prices rise on Ukraine. Clint uh, Elrich seems to be a Russia-Ukraine expert. Uh, says, breaking, Ukraine declares nationwide state of emergency. He seems to think that there's a better chance that Russia does invade than a week ago. Uh, as they're starting to prepare their population of uh, conflict ahead. So a week ago, uh, Ukraine's president was joking about there will be no attack. And Russia was saying they have no plans to attack. And they weren't warning their population about it. That's all changed. And now they've taken over a better part of half of Ukraine. And the U.S. has done absolutely nothing meaningful about it. Harold Malgren says, Putin just warned weapons without parallel in the world are being put on combat duty. These ominous words escalate threats far beyond the Biden administration's cautious Ukraine calculations today. So yeah, if NATO does allow Russia to take over Ukraine, uh, the big question is, will this destabilize Europe and Asia and create a, a lot of conflict over there? And it, uh, so that's a reasonable reason to believe that uh, this could spiral out of control. So we've really got to just be patient here, 
and see how this plays out. Uh, hopefully, Putin's going to stop encroaching and this de-escalates, because uh, otherwise this could get ugly relatively quickly. OK, uh, Jurian Timmer from Fidelity says, don't look now, but the ratio of large cap growth to small cap value appears to be forming a small head and shoulders top. If it follows through, it'd be, it would support my thesis that value in quality defense, emerging markets, could outperform the big growers in 2022. And that's actually exactly what we've been forecasting over the long run, over this cycle. I do think you're going to see great outperformance uh, out of emerging markets relative to the US. And then we're going to have uh, essentially a overperformance in value over growth. In the short term, I'm thinking the exact opposite. I believe yields are about to fall, inflation is going to fall, and growth is going to dramatically outperform in the short term. But remember, once the CPI falls, expect the U.S. to start spending money and get those inflation expectations back up, because that's what the U.S. likes to do the most. Now, uh, and they're on a clock, okay? The Democrats are highly, highly likely to lose the House or Senate and make it much harder to pass spending bills uh, after midterms this December. So the clock to spend money uh, is slowing down. And once you realize just how corrupt all these people are and their main job is to spend as much as possible, uh, then it's, it's unwise to bet against high levels of spending and uh, really pushing stimulus through the US economy. Sean says, isn't the majority of the worst case takeover already priced in the market? No, no, nothing bad has really happened in terms of uh, sanctions. So if anything, the market has priced in that the US won't do diddly squat. So if that, if NATO, and it's hard because uh, France and Germany really don't want to get, uh, all of Europe really doesn't want to get cut off of energy from Russia. Okay, so uh, the U.S. push for this war is not necessarily what Germany, China, uh, or much of Europe wants. So yeah, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen here. Kevin says, I don't see why Putin would stop. The sanctions are basically meaningless as long as Europe keeps buying gas and oil from Russia. Yeah, I, uh, which would be fine as far as how we're positioned if that was the case. It's really the yeah, we have two, two unknowns. How far is Putin going to push the, the limit on this? And what response will Europe uh, have? Ed says, so should uh, ARC do well? No, I think ARC's going to do well when there's massive QE. So I'd actually expect the triple Q to outperform ARC or just Tesla. Um, so I'd much rather be long Tesla or the triple Q than ARC. ARC clearly did really well in a weird world where you lock down everything and you pump trillions of dollars and you get these outrageous uh, growth expectations of companies that don't make money. We're not in that environment. We're not going to go back to that environment uh, anytime soon. So, so no, I would bet on uh, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, they're trading super cheap. I like Tesla trading super cheap relative to recent highs. I like the triple Q and I definitely like obviously Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think you won't have a better return with less risk over the next decade than just betting massively on Ethereum uh, to be really simple about where we have the best opportunity here. Okay, uh, so, so yeah, interesting. We did see Russia expand during Obama and Biden, not during Trump. Trump was supposedly the Russian spy. So uh, just something to, to understand about history there. Uh, meanwhile, Twitter selling a billion dollars in junk bonds to fund share buybacks. So again, the tech stocks are in a lot of pain right now this year. U.S. warns Ukraine of full-scale Russian invasion within 48 hours, senior officials to Newsweek. J.P. Morgan says oil prices will average $110 in the second quarter. Uh, I can see that, absolutely, but I still think we're on the verge of a massive pullback to the 
dollar price as a, a maximum bottom before it goes back up and that governments will intervene to force that damn price down because it is really bad for politics. So probably another uh, synchronized release of oil globally to get those costs down and you throw in a de-escalation. Uh, so, and again, you guys know I love being along the oil and gas plays. We made a lot of money in NRGU. We sold too early. We're now waiting for boil to boil up for us. Uh, but in general, I wanna cut that position soon and buy the dip on a de-escalation and, and potentially government intervention to get those costs down. Because I do think they're going back up, uh, but I think it's really overdone to the upside currently. The long view says, watch the price. We had blowout payrolls, blowout inflation print, more hawkishness priced in and the threat of war. And we didn't make new lows. Uh, that's because these sanctions were weak. Uh, one of the sanctions was on their debt markets, but uh, Russia has no debt. They run a 22% uh, debt to GDP. And look what they've done uh, oh, since Trump came in. So they dumped all of their bonds and they have been building up a reserve of dollars and gold. And they are ready for a prolonged war. Absolutely. So we can't threaten that we're going to take away the money they lent us because they have pulled it all out. Uh, meanwhile, inflation's at, yeah, he, he Putin has timed this perfectly. Daniel D. Martino Booth says mortgage-backed application purchases fell 10%, wow, and 5% year over year, refis tank 15%. Rising rates on top of near record high in loan size after six relentless weeks of increases, not a good combo for home purchase affordability and pace of transactions. So the economy is slowing down. I think we're going to get more of a dovish surprise from the Fed that they're really talking up all this hawkish rhetoric to try to uh, cool off markets. And they have sure done that, haven't they? Just in a large scale cyber attack is underway in Ukraine. Multiple ministry, public sector, and bank websites are down. Here's a look at the Russian exports as a percentage of global supply. Uh, the main one they dominate is the palladium market. Uh, but they have a huge chunk of natural gas and that's the one uh, that could be very problematic for Europe in the short term. Uh, but big producer of oil, gold, platinum, and wheat. So uh, all the things that are having expensive prices at record highs right now, uh, that's their money makers. So uh, if we want to put pain on Russia, it's going to put pain on the entire world in a really meaningful way. Julian Biddle says, we're getting close to something big. Bears have been in control, but the balance of power could be shifting. Sentiment is very bearish. Bull to bear is the lowest since April of 2020. Historically, these kinds of extremes have resulted in strong rallies. Stay nimble, stay open-minded. So this is looking at the bearishness. And again, it's close to where we shut down the entire globe. Uh, over so far a mild skirmish and a bond market crash that's been overdone. So unless we think the bond market's going to keep crashing, which I absolutely do not think is on the verge, uh, or we're about to sanction Russia super aggressively, uh, I remain bullish on growth assets, as you know. Okay, Tom Cotton says Biden canceled the Keystone Pipeline, banned drilling on federal land, and declared war on American energy production. We warned him this would raise costs for Americans and put our national security at risk. And now they're blaming the uh, high energy costs on Russia. David Rosenberg says, if the stock market angst is all about Putin, then why would autos be 30% down from the highs, home builders down 24% in a bear market, or retail stocks off 19%? What do they have to do with geopolitics? They clearly reflect the rates market resetting for a Fed-induced economic turndown. So this guy loves bonds. His basic thesis was to be long the TLT and Amazon over the last year. So both of those have been whacked over the head. Again, it's been very hard to make money in the first two months of uh, 
2022. This has caught the world by surprise, uh, and there's really been very low, few places to hide. And we're doing well. We're honestly doing a lot better than almost anyone uh, who was positioned uh, in a way that worked last year. What worked last year is not working this year, and there's really very few strategies that have uh, done well. So I'm very happy with our current return uh, when we look at uh, everything that we've been faced with. Okay, CBS News. The U.S. economy economy has been hit with increased gas prices, inflation, and supply chain issues due to the Ukraine crisis, which is a complete joke. Uh, no planes flying over Ukraine. This continues to escalate at the moment. Meanwhile, we've got this truck convoy uh, spreading worldwide. Now, if they have their way and get rid of all these mandates, this is going to be inflationary and get the economies reopening and get those energy costs back up. In the short term, obviously, this can cripple economies. And we're seeing some pretty outrageous things happening in Canada uh, from, from that protest. Also, that's been a huge advertisement for why you want to own cryptocurrency as uh, the Canadians are... Uh, essentially calling anyone who is donating to this group a terrorist and blocking and shutting down their bank accounts. Uh, Chris says, are you still thinking about RSX as a potential play still? Yes, I think it's going to be a beautiful play. Uh, it'll, it'll be a way for us to keep exposure to energy even during the expected pullback I'm seeing in the price of oil. So I don't want to be completely out of the inflation hedge. So we'll wait till this gets to a peak catalyst and we'll sell UVXY and boil. We're gonna add to Ethereum. We're gonna add to Bitcoin. We're gonna add to the NASDAQ and we'll most likely go long RSX uh, until it catches up with the relative value of oil. Um, and then once oil does pull back, we could potentially rotate out of RSX into NRGU once NRGU has really crashed a lot. So yeah, very, very sexy play coming up for RSX. Wouldn't dare do it today though, just to be clear. Um, just because we don't know what the hell these guys are gonna do. Okay, Antonio says, sincerely, I have no idea what Germany is doing, closing down nuclear power plants, blocking Nord Stream 2, wanting to step out of coal. What's the plan? What's the purpose? Yeah, there does seem to be a general push to make energy costs go up. Uh, in certain countries. Uh, this is a big thread from Clint uh, Elrich or Erich, Erlich, and essentially saying the US is lobbying to put a no fly zone over Ukraine and that this could create a, a massive meltdown in the economy and a, and a war. Um, so, again, it's uh, very hard to make heads or tails out of this. We're hedged. We don't need to worry about it. So, yeah, we're just going to have to sit tight here. Uh, meanwhile, stimulus coming back in through Hong Kong. And, again, China, Hong Kong are all getting ready to push money through their economy really hard, uh, even though I think we're going to get a quick big bounce in the NASDAQ and Bitcoin and Ethereum. Long term, I think you're gonna make the most money this next decade uh, by being long Asia via emerging markets. And that's because US is likely to, going to severely slow down its credit expansion, especially if the government goes gridlock over the next four years, which is highly likely to happen after midterms. And meanwhile, China is gonna be ramping up credit. So uh, for our safe growth strategy, we're currently very big on uh, EDC. And that could potentially have a, a meaningful play uh, for our high risk strategy, but not yet. Right now, I want to focus on Ethereum. I want to focus on selling Boyle and UVXY at the right time and potentially buying the dip on RSX, which is the Russia ETF, which is getting pounded lower and, and was extremely correlated to the price of oil. So it's at a huge discount um, if we're willing to take that risk. Okay, Peter Schiff was critical of Biden's press conference yesterday because he didn't take questions. 
The nation was treated to another phony POTUS press conference as President Biden delivered a speech to a room full of reporters, then abruptly left without answering a single question. He could have delivered his remarks from the Oval Office without the risk of spreading, that case being a joker with the last comment. AMD overtakes Intel, uh, just showing you the growth of technology in general. Okay, Jeffrey Gunlack, uh, someone I pay close attention to, one of the largest money managers in the world, managing 134 billion or so, uh, known as the Bond King, says, if there is a market on the probability of Germany upping its proportional NATO contributions, let me know so I can short it. Uh, basically saying uh, Germany's not game for punishing Russia uh, over this. Jeffrey Gunlack says Joe Biden needs right now to explain to American taxpayers what the definition of success is in any involvement in Ukraine. Before that, Joe Biden needs to explain convincingly why American taxpayers should pay to defend the Ukraine border at all. Don't hold your breath. Uh, okay, and the backstory on this is essentially the US has put in a, a puppet government into Ukraine and overthrown uh, its government, using it as a, a proxy. A uh, joke about Ethereum 2.0 coming out with Vitalik, just some funnies there. We got Elon making fun of Web3. Okay, here's a look at the drawdown in the NASDAQ. So again, you got to go back to the great shutdown of the entire world where uh, people were having massive losses um, to get back to levels close to this. So I think maybe a little more pain, but then we're going to rocket ship back up. So uh, we're holding the line here. A lot of people are asking why no questions at the press conference. Now, Jury and Timur of Fidelity says, with all the eyes on the nervous world of Russia and Ukraine, the bond market has started to unprice some of the rate hikes expected for 2022. So yeah, we go to war, rates to probably go down because everybody rushes to the safe haven asset. Uh, we don't go to war, rates probably come down because the global economy is slowing down and energy costs are gonna go down. So I see really no outcome where the bond market sells off further uh, than that recent low we've had this year. Uh, and that, again, this is very good for tech stocks as we've been beating over the bush, uh, which is hard to listen to when you see them having all this pain to start out the year. But again, is the root cause of the pain going to continue or is it on the verge of a reversal? Okay, we're seeing loud blast. So yeah, the, the, the war is definitely aggravating and escalating at this point. And Clint is saying that Russia was celebrating uh, the recognition of uh, those two uh, parts of Ukraine as part of Russia. Boris. Reifkin says Putin gave a longer than 50 minute address without notes rattling off an alternate neo-imperial and Soviet revanchist history of the 20th century. Biden could barely muster a 10 minute statement, took no questions, fumbled over his words and stuck to preloaded talking points. Let's read this little thread. Just by way of observation, not even getting into whether Biden's response was or wasn't strong or credible enough. We need a crossover between JFK Reagan in Berlin right now, or JFK during the Cuban Missile Crisis. That level of impact and authority, too much to hope for here, but I would have loved a response to Putin's historical narrative, which counters its substance point by point. It may seem silly to us to entertain these things, 
but there's an ideology here which animates not only Kremlin decision makers, it's called taking the ideological initiative and making clear the range of reasons for why Putin has been engaged in this sort of racket for years and how this is strategically dooming and isolating Russia as a whole, setting precedents which will come to haunt it. The uh, Blinken says the meeting with Russia's Lavrov is canceled, which Biden was warning was likely uh, in the Sunday update we got. Uh, Genevieve says, why does the Russia-Ukraine development get orders of magnitude greater uh, than when China sacked Hong Kong? Fair question. Macro chart says maybe similar to 2016 and 11, spike triggered near bounce peak, market retested lows, sentiment plunged, but key stocks remained in buy position. Capitulation created the best buy opportunity of the year. Building focused exposure to the right stocks was critical to success. So he's looking at RSI and the selling pressure on the NASDAQ and the big rebound. Okay, that's exactly what I'm forecasting as soon as this de-escalates. And again, same. Uh, now he's looking at the MACD. Okay, so that's good headlines. Okay, Rose says, what will happen to oil price if the US will use our reserve? It'll go down for a little bit and go right back up as we get back to no mandate world. Okay, let's take a quick look. So we've got a 1.7% crash in the SPY today, 2.5% crash in the NASDAQ to close out. Bitcoin's down 1.2%. Um, Ethereum uh, flat and Polygon, the uh, kind of the super high risk crypto we track, uh, a partner for Ethereum is still up 4%. So very interesting, 8% gain on UVXY on the day and boils up 5%. So more pain for equities, uh, but not enough for a, an outright panic yet. Okay, so let's take a look at some charts. So here's the bond market. Uh, this is what's been creating the sell-off in the NASDAQ, in my opinion, is interest rates rising. And so we've seen they've really peaked out and are trading flat. I don't see these going any higher anytime soon. Um, so yeah, I think peak interest rates are here for the short term. Okay, the probability of a 50 basis point rate hike in March has gone down. We've seen it as high as like 90%, it's down to 32%. At this point, I think there's essentially zero chance the Federal Reserve uh, hikes uh, 50 basis points in March. Um, so that would be relatively dovish uh, for the bond market as it's already priced in a 25, but not a 50. Reverse repo uh, still going up at 1.7 trillion. I'm not gonna be worried about an all out bond market crash until reverse repo is drained. Uh, so long story to explain what that is, but just think of it as a buffer for quantitative easing. So as soon as this starts draining, we can get worried about the next leg down in bonds. Uh, for now, I think that fear is over. Here's a look at Boyle versus NRGU uh, from the 10th. And we can see Boyle's up 29%, NRGU is down eight. Let's zoom out a bit though. And we'll see how correlated these two are and So if we do go back to December 31st, uh, Boyle had outperformed for like a day dramatically, pulled back big time, and now it's gaining on NRGU quickly. Uh, Jeff Monroe does not like the, uh, I can't even talk about it, Jeff will get banned. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you on that one, Jeff. Okay, now we're looking at lumber futures relative to oil. Uh, lumber futures did predict a oil sell-off last year in May, and it took about two months to play out. Um, 
it had a little self and has been gaining wind again. So there's really no signs of a uh, significant sell-off in energy in the very short term. Uh, I do think we need a de-escalation and probably some government intervention to cool off energy costs. And that's probably on the horizon. So we gotta be careful about boil and get out at the right time. Now we're comparing gold to copper. And so you can see gold's getting the bid and copper's getting dumped a little bit uh, in the short term due to the war headlines. And you can see gold up 4%. Let's go for the uh, start of the year. So gold's actually doing good finally after being really boring. So if we go all the way back to here, you made 6% um, on gold while copper's up 1%. And again, this is signaling yield should fall. If gold's going up faster than copper, then the economy's cooling off. Baltic dry index has been crashing, but uh, getting some stabilization. That measures the cost of shipping commodities between continents. And there's that rise in the yellow line, that's interest rates rising. You can see it drove uh, the big oil and gas companies up and it drove the NASDAQ down. Now, again, do we think the economy is heating up or slowing down from here? I think it's gonna slow down until more stimulus comes through. So that would indicate bond yields fall. And again, your growth stocks go up. So there's a big risk in a crash short term uh, in oil, especially is what I'm worried about, yeah, which will be a great opportunity because we do wanna buy that dip. Now in this chart, we are looking at the price of oil uh, sitting here at 90. So the recent lows we've seen uh, were 57 and it rallied up for about four months and had about a month and a half pull back to 62, rallied up for a handful of months to 84, pulled back to 65. Now it's made a massive leg higher to 95. Uh, and unless, uh, unless Russia cuts off oil to Europe, and natural gas, I don't think it's going to break this recent high until it has a big pullback. And I think that pullback could hit the $75 to $80 range. And then we want to buy it with all hands. Now let's look at RSX and do it relative to percent change. So we can see these things are extremely correlated. Now you can get RSX. Uh, I mean, look at the spread on this puppy. So the spread on this is now at uh, 69%. So boy, oh boy, we want to buy RSX at the right time. Um, now we're going to be patient. I don't care if we get the very, very bottom. Yeah, I don't care if we get the very, very bottom price. As soon as it looks like the coast is clear, RSX is a hell of a discount to be long oil. And wow, that's got to be a, one of the best trades of the earth. If we if uh, we time it right, and how much lower could RSX go? Let's let's go ahead and hide. Let's just switch this over. So the Russian stock index is down forty five percent since November. <laughs> Massive. Um, if we went back to the two thousand twenty level, though. Still some more pain here. So we might just get the most absolutely ridiculous buying opportunity if we're just patient, assuming this escalates. If it doesn't escalate, uh, then fine. Uh, it'll still be a good opportunity. Uh, but yeah, you can see that extreme correlation for uh, forever. Uh, and even outperformance. So the, the trade setup for RSX at the right time could be massive. That will most likely be a trade alert soon. Okay, here we're looking at the emerging markets. And this has been outperforming US markets by going down less uh, this year. So if we look at the sell-off from... Uh, go from here and we'll add in the NASDAQ. Uh, we can see from, from this point, 
the NASDAQ's down 17%. Emerging markets are only down 6.8. So we're starting to see money flow into Asia uh, and buy the cheap stocks and dump the uh, very expensive stocks here in the US. Russell 2000, uh, starting to stabilize here. This was our most bearish US uh, position earlier, um, but now we have all indexes below the 200 day moving average, I believe. So, so yeah, the markets are very stressed out. You're gonna get forced selling if this doesn't pop back up. And so again, that will make UVXY skyrocket. Uh, here's our European index, not crashing too hard, still down. Uh, so from that same point we were observing in the NASDAQ, uh, we're down about 14% in EFO. So some pain in Europe, which makes sense as that's where this escalation is occurring. This chart, we're looking at the dollar index. It's being uh, pretty steady here. So this could have been a place to hide money over the last three months. Bonds didn't protect you. Uh, only thing that's done well are the energy plays and the shorting the stocks with UVXY. Nothing else has done well so far to start up the year. China's currency trading flat, nothing crazy coming out of China right now. All eyes on uh, this conflict in Europe. This chart, we're looking at some of the pain in tech stocks. We got some classics down 30%. NVIDIA and Tesla down 30% each. So. A lot of pain there. And again, uh, as soon as we deescalate, I'd expect those to moonshot higher. This chart, we're looking at interest rates rising against uh, Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, and Bank of America, a lot less pain and even some gains in there during this pullback for tech stocks. So we're seeing that growth to value uh, illustrated here as interest rates rise. Now again, are interest rates gonna keep going up or are we headed into a slowdown? Here is Alibaba, Tencent and Taiwan Semiconductor. We're hoping to see Alibaba and Tencent start to outperform Taiwan Semiconductors, showing that China is getting ready to uh, stimulate their economy and stop hurting tech giants, which have been sold off massively. If I zoom out a bit, you can see this huge discount. Now, in our safe growth strategy, we do have a big position in all three of these companies in Asia. Uh, but you can see Alibaba from its peak is down 58%, Tencent down 40%, uh, while Taiwan Semiconductor is only down 8 Toyota, uh, feeling the pain. So we're getting that warning sign out of Europe right now. And again, if this de-escalates, I would expect Toyota to jump back up. Uh, but now we're seeing warning signs in more equity markets than just the US. Here's Exxon selling off, even though oil's going up. So that's problematic and predicting a energy sell-off. You can see Exxon's down 7% as oil keeps peaking up higher and higher. Now, this is the yield curve of the two year and 10 year, and it's been falling uh, down to a 40 basis point gap. This is typically what predicts a recession. Uh, but again, in general, what causes the crash is the long end rising. And we don't see the long end rising anytime soon. Um, so we're just seeing this yield curve collapse. And so it predicted the uh, all of the recessions and it just shows a messed up economy. It gets short-term inflation, uh, ruining long-term growth expectations, predicting a crash into the future. And so again, it's once that long end starts rising rapidly that you get the triggering point. So the TLT crashing is our biggest problem. Uh, Steven says, did Biden make an executive order banning new investment in China? There's some, I think it was pretty much the same sanctions uh, that we've had from Trump era, Not, nothing much changed. Okay, so here's the most important charts. Uh, TLT, again, uh, this is a re repeat of last year. We had bonds crash to start the year out and then ease all year. So you had, if you remember the NASDAQ and Bitcoin crash and then they ripped higher all year. 
Uh, then the same thing just repeated. Out of nowhere, the bond market just crashes and takes everything down with it that's growth related, uh, tech, uh, stock related. And now what's gonna happen? Is the bond market just gonna keep crashing or is about to, to go up? And I think it's gonna flatline and go up until the US uh, passes more stimulus, essentially. Now, if the more problematic charts could be uh, moving forward, this. So these are also at pretty important levels. Uh, we really need to see the investment grade bond market stop crashing and J and K stop crashing. So let's go to a shorter term chart. Uh, these continue to have drawdown and uh, will be problematic. And actually what could cause the Fed to be more dovish, they care much more about credit markets breaking than equity markets. And so uh, these I do anticipate will stop falling with the TLT as well. Tesla and the Ethereum trust, just showing a high correlation. Uh, those are where I see the best returns uh, as soon as this de-escalation occurs. Tesla or Ethereum, uh, at least that you can have exposure to in the NASDAQ, or excuse me, the stock market. Um, I think you'll get even, even better return in Polygon, Ethereum's partner, uh, if you know how to get into that asset through your cryptocurrency account. Uh, it's currently not in the stock market. Okay, silver and gold going up on the war drum beats. So we're not in those positions currently, but I'm paying close attention to them. Uh, we've got UVXY up 31% per, since the 17th. Bonds are flat, the dollar's flat. This is the only defensive hedge that worked in the short term. Here we're looking at three positions. Uh, copper miners we're not in currently. We're in rare earth metals and uranium. These are great long-term plays. Um, and they've been in some pain. So if we zoom out, uh, we can see a drawdown of up to 28% in uranium and 12% in rare earth metals. And we need a lot of these raw materials uh, for the decade ahead. So we remain very bullish on that unless something significantly changes in the economy. Here's a look at that gold copper ratio, uh, which predicts interest rates trading flat and the latest leg is down. So really don't think rates are gonna rise anytime soon. Now over here, we'll look at the yield curve and we'll look at it over the last few months. Uh, in general, we're seeing long-term growth expectations falling and we're seeing short-term rate hike expectations or inflation fears rising. And that's what creates problems uh, for everything. Here's what they want it to look like. We've got to go all the way back to excuse me, October of 2020. There's what they like. This is the shape they really want. And by they, the banks, the Federal Reserve. Okay, so like a ramp said they've got a hill. So will rate hikes fix this? Maybe. They need to get the short-term inflation expectations down without crushing the economy. Can they pull off a soft landing? Um, so maybe a few rate hikes does give the market what it wants to put away some of these uh, inflationary fears. Here's the futures term structure for the VIX. Uh, it's in backwardation. This is set up to scream higher if there's any more short-term pain in stocks. So we get a big, big, panic in the stock market, UVXY is going to scream higher. And we will uh, figure out what's causing the problem, wait for the resolution, dump that, and buy tech stocks. John says, are you considering adding Polygon? No, not unless it's in the stock market. So our private equity deal has huge exposure to Ethereum and Polygon. Um, but yeah, I, I would rather just have you in Ethereum for Portfolio Builder because you can do it from the stock market, nice and safe. Um, but yeah, let's just look at that return on Polygon. It's just massive. So it's a more volatile asset, but um, 
Oops, let me go to a daily chart. So just Polygon just smashing Ethereum's return um, over this period up 650% compared to Ethereum. Now, if I zoom in here, let's see. If I go to this point, uh, Ethereum's caught up with it, uh, lost the outperformance towards the end of the year. And so, yeah, um, if we're bullish on this group of assets, Polygon is going to just kick some major ass here as soon as the inflation comes down. Um, but it's also going to have the most downside. So uh, if this continues to escalate. Nothing too exciting there. I've uh, The only two charts that I'm interested in the economic data, because uh, there's just too much to, to process. We've got rising wages. We've got high energy costs, but we do have falling housing prices and we have falling uh, car prices and we have uh, a huge buildup of inventory. So in general, I just wanna see the rate of change of the core inflation to slow down and fall by April uh, for the way we're positioned to play out. And I wanna see the PPI flatline and, and start to fall. And so it looks like it's flatlining, looks like these predictions will be accurate and a de-escalation in uh, Ukraine and getting energy costs down could really speed up that really, really fast. Meanwhile, uh, with all the talk of tightening monetary policy, uh, let's take a look at the Fed's balance sheet. It uh, just hit a new high last week and it'll hit a new high this week. So the money printing continues uh, in Europe and US. Okay, we're about to hop into exact asset allocation for both strategies. Uh, but this is where your video ends. If you're not a paid member, you're gonna not get the sell alerts. You're not gonna know how to allocate your capital. And you're not gonna have access to our membership area where you can punch in how much money you want to invest and it'll calculate exactly what to buy. So call Dean to upgrade at 505-322-7515 right now.